On August 15th, Mariam Hotak woke up in a new country, an Islamic emirate. After 20 years of pro-Western governments, Islamist Taliban militants had swept to power in Afghanistan in a matter of days following the departure of U.S. troops, taking the capital Kabul with barely a shot being fired. Since then, the country's new rulers have been making their presence felt, imposing their own version of Sharia law on nearly 20 million Afghan women. For us as women, the future is unclear. Will we be able to get an education or go to work? A woman's voice on the airwaves. In today's Afghanistan, that's no longer a given. Indeed, in several provinces, it's already a thing of the past. Today's first question is simple. What country does the sun hit first? When the sun rises in the morning, which country does it shine on first? Ferozian, welcome. What have you brought us from mazar -e sharif Mariam Hotak spends an hour on weekday mornings talking to listeners on her phone-in show, taking musical requests and quizzing them on their general knowledge. But even a show as uncontroversial as this breakfast phone-in is having to move with the times. We can't laugh on air like before. We can't joke with our audience the way we used to. The whole program isn't as free. I've even had to change my clothes. Indian dance music has been replaced by nashids, or religious recitations. And the music that is left is local, low-key, and for the most part, sung by men. And all this has happened without the new Taliban authorities having to give any direct instructions. Most media don't even understand what the Taliban mean by operating according to Sharia law and how to go forward. New limitations and taboos have appeared. I've noticed that women's shows have been cut by many outlets, and the hosts can't present the shows the way they used to. This radio station's management, like most other Afghan media, are already doing everything they can to avoid drawing undue attention and have to guess what is and what isn't acceptable for Afghanistan's new rulers. For now, they're just about getting by, but not everyone is so lucky. haven't practiced since the Taliban came. We are afraid. If the Taliban come here, they will break our instruments. Even at home, Ghulam plays for us with the windows firmly shut, afraid of whom might be listening. Performing in public is out of the question. I didn't believe the Taliban would come so soon. We had a lot of national forces. We didn't believe they would come so easily. Two days before the Taliban came to Kabul, I had a concert on Tolo TV. I had a program just two days before the Taliban came. There's little hope of that being repeated anytime soon. For now, there only seem to be two options, find a new job or leave. Neither is very realistic as Afghanistan's economy tanks. Banks are shut and even those with money put aside are unable to access it. I spent more than 16 years of my life learning this music. I regret it because I spent all my life becoming a musician, which is now useless in Afghanistan. All music learning is finished in Afghanistan. Music is dead in Afghanistan. Now, away from the wedding halls and TV cameras he used to perform in front of, 
Ghulam is trying to make a living here in the streets near his home. But it's just not enough to feed himself and his six children, a family that is by no means big by Afghan standards. I have, I have six children and a big responsibility on me. My daily expenditure is around a thousand Afghani. And I earn about 100. It's much less. I sold my refrigerator, carpet, just to provide food for my family. And it's not just music that's practiced behind closed doors in Afghanistan these days. The same goes for journalism, especially if it's a woman holding the mic. Going out onto the streets to interview strangers is unthinkable for a female journalist in Kabul nowadays. Instead, Mariam is interviewing media manager Dunya Paktianai about her efforts to get women's stories told. Dunya's take is far from optimistic. I am 100% sure that the Taliban are fooling the world regarding their behavior towards women just to secure international recognition. Since one requirement the world has asked of the Taliban is to meet women's rights. Even if the Taliban have yet to ban women working outside the home, the unspoken signals are already having the desired effect with families pressuring women to limit what they do, giving their bosses an excuse to fire them. On private TV stations, only a handful of women have kept their jobs, and soon enough all the women will be dismissed there as well. You can't work anymore, you can't go after a report as before, and your work is no longer effective for us, is what they are being told there. Both Mariam and Dunya are too young to remember much of the Taliban's first time in power, but snatches of memory remain. One day, I remember, I have a faint picture of it, when my aunt entered a shop buying fabric and pulled up her borka in order to look at the fabric. It was then a Taliban fighter came in, holding a whip in hand, a vice police member, I assume, and beat my aunt with it. While the Taliban vice police have yet to get back on the streets this time around, the disapproving stares are already a fact of daily life. Just now, while I was waiting for Dunya, a vehicle stopped suddenly, inside which a Taliban stared at me for a long time, examining me from head to toe and looking up into my eyes angrily. He repeated the whole thing until he drove away after the traffic opened. Then Dunya came out of her house. I looked at him, thinking neither he nor I would lose anything by doing so. Look at me and I will look at you, I said. It was an evil act for him. Moving around the city means navigating countless Taliban checkpoints. Not a comfortable situation for women like Mariam. Without a burqa and without the male guardian the Taliban insists should accompany women outside the home. Security was the one thing that the Taliban were supposed to be able to promise ordinary Afghans, even if the economy tanked and the new restrictions graded with many. After all, it was the Taliban who were responsible for most attacks under the previous government. But a recent uptick in attacks by the so-called Islamic State has dashed those hopes. And it's not just women falling foul of the controls, Many Kabul musicians have already paid dearly for their run-ins with the country's new rulers. This keyboard is all one of these musicians has left after a brush with the new police. The drums they took apart themselves, in expectation of raids that, for now at least, have yet to happen. 
When the Taliban took over, they told us to stop performing. They said silencing music was one of the reasons they'd been fighting a jihad for decades. I know nothing else and have done no other work in my life except performing music. Everyone is dismayed, shocked. A silence has taken over the city. And the threats are working. After 12 years as a wedding singer, this man is now trying to scrape by as a porter. The wealthiest musicians in this community have all left for Iran, he tells us, a place where they can still earn a good living with their music. Those without the necessary cash are stuck in Kabul, trying to survive as best they can. Chronicling Afghanistan's shifting reality day by day is what Mariam does for her other job as a video journalist for an international news agency. Working for foreign media, for now at least, means freedom from some of the constraints on Afghanistan's domestic media. But out on the streets with a camera, she finds herself having to defer to male colleagues to do things she would unquestioningly have done herself just a few months before. Does she ever think of throwing in the towel? I struggled for a long time to get my family to finally accept my choice of career. If we give up the profession now out of fear or frustration, we'd be doing our profession a cowardly disservice. We must not allow Afghan journalism to go quiet again. If its voice is silenced, all of Afghanistan will be muted again. But what will the personal price of staying and fighting for a career be for Mariam and women like her? And will there even be anything left to fight for? Hundreds of thousands of Afghans have already decided they don't want to stick around to find out and have packed their bags. For now at least, Mariam Hotak isn't ready to join them. <laughs>